So thanks everyone for joining us tonight. I'm Emily Fagan, the Director of Outreach for the BC Humanist Association. And there's just like a quick few things I have to say uh, before turning things over to Matthew, our speaker for tonight. Um, so first I want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the ancestral and unceded homelands of the Songhees, Esquimalt and Wissanic peoples whose historic relationships continue to this day. Uh, tonight's talk by Ra Matthew Randemski is entitled uh, From Ashrams to Multi-Level Marketing to QAnon, Cults Then and Now. A couple of quick housekeeping notes before we start. Uh, given the turnout, everyone has been muted except for Matthew and I to prevent any inadvertent interruptions. So there'll be a brief Q&A at the end of tonight's event. Um, feel free to use the chat function in the um, bottom bar to ask questions, uh, but obviously be respectful of one another and of our speaker. Um, tonight's talk is recorded and it will be released on our YouTube channel and podcast later in the next few weeks. The BCHA is a charitable organization and is able to do the work we do through the generosity of our members. Um, this week, we kicked off our end of year fundraiser, which is important uh, for allowing us to fund more research projects and for community, community building events, such as tonight's talk. Um, if you enjoy tonight's event and want to see more programming continue through the spring, consider making a donation at bchumanist.ca slash 2020 underscore fundraiser. I'll paste the link in the chat. Um, coming soon in December, we're gonna be hosting a trivia night. So please keep an eye on our newsletter and social media for information on how to RSVP to that very soon. Um, our speaker, Matthew Randemski, is a survivor of two cults whose work has, and his work has been pivotal in illuminating the culture of sexual abuse and yoga cults and the shadows of globalized yoga and Buddhism. Uh, Rendemsky also teaches yoga and is the author of more than half a dozen books of poetry, fiction, and nonfiction. Uh, so from there, Matthew, I'll let you take it. Thanks, Emily. Thanks so much for the invitation. Um, uh, welcome to everybody. Uh, and I hope that you're doing well in British Columbia or wherever you are. Um, I thought that with only an hour, what would be really useful would be to bring some uh, historical and definitional clarity to the question of uh, what is the cult? Um, how does it function? What are its dynamics? What are its rules and mechanisms? Uh, and then apply that um, theory to uh, various scenarios, um, including contemporary scenarios that are beginning to emerge and uh, make uh, some of our literature problematic, actually. Uh, what we'll see is a lot of the discourse around uh, cultic dynamics has grown up actually in the pre-digital era. And now that it's confronted with uh, online phenomena such as QAnon and the broader uh, conspiratorial movement that some colleagues and I are, are naming conspirituality, uh, we're seeing holes in old theories that uh, we're trying to race to fill in. So um, I'll, I've got some slides to show that are quite simple. Uh, and I invite you to take uh, screenshots. Uh, Emily can do that as well. And, you know, if there's a way of circulating those, that's great. Um, you know, I, I would encourage you to uh, let your questions, whatever questions you have come up uh, in within the flow of the conversation uh, or the flow of the presentation. And uh, that way you'll be less likely to forget them uh, if something really sticks out that you'd like to uh, focus on. And um, depending upon the number of questions, I'll either speak for a half an hour or 40 minutes or 45 minutes, but I'll make sure that there's a good amount of, of time left for, for questions. Um, so uh, yeah, let me go ahead and screen share. Um, and uh, we'll take a look at some definitions and dynamics. And, and the first thing that I'd like to say is that uh, the word cult itself has taken on a kind of very broad, low definition pop psychology uh, flavor. Um, and, and, and that's been true probably for a couple of decades. But as we enter into what I think is now a kind of golden age of cult studies and, and, and media, especially with the arrival of so many cult documentaries to platforms like Netflix. Um, I, I think it's important for 
uh, a kind of a, a general sharpening up of what the term means. It does mean something specific. Uh, it's been worked at for a long time by some very smart people. Uh, and I would just request, uh, you know, that uh, you, you consider going forward uh, the ramifications of, of referring to cults or cultic dynamics in non-specific ways, and, and especially uh, to consider the implications of making jokes about cults as well, because, um, you know, cults ruin people's lives, uh, and there's a number of um, uh, misconceptions around how people get involved and uh, why they might be vulnerable to indoctrination uh, that I'll speak to. But, you know, things that have entered into popular discourse that I would say are indicative of, of a kind of dismissal of the seriousness of cultic dynamics are phrases such as, um, you know, well, they really drank the Kool-Aid. Now, you know, I, there's no, there's, there's nothing wrong with colloquial expressions on one hand, but on the other hand, um, there's a way in which that phrase itself kind of uh, illuminates a, a core problem around the way in which cults are understood. And that's that um, the, the member, the person who is recruited and winds up being indoctrinated is generally viewed as um, somebody who's silly or um, frivolous or stupid or in, in the case of, of uh, the Kool-Aid comment, you know, somebody who wanted something sugary and insubstantial. And so that's what they did. Now, of course, uh, the reference is to the murder of 900 people in the jungle of Guyana uh, at Jonestown in 1982, I believe. Uh, and uh, when I say murder, um, the ingestion of Kool-Aid was the, was the, um, was the was the cause of death, but we're not talking about people who willingly drank. Uh, many were forced at gunpoint, uh, and um, there were also, I think, uh, about three hundred children amongst the the full total. So, so if you use a phrase like that, you're you're. Um, I sound like I'm uh, already chewing you all out, but <laughs> but so that's not that's that's not my intention. But I just want to you to be aware of the kind of. Um, uh, trivialization uh, that uh, the subject is often approached with and, and what its implications might be. Okay, that's enough of my uh, lecture. Uh, let me go back. So um, there are some standard definitions that I, I think are very helpful. Uh, and But first of all, let me just give a couple of, of synonyms. Uh, so taken from uh, Lalich and Landau's uh, book, um, which is called Bounded Choice, uh, the list of, of this list of synonyms, synonyms is, I think, particularly helpful. So uh, high demand is exactly as it would sound, that uh, one's engagement with a group is predicated upon fulfilling uh, at an, a seemingly impossible list of demands constantly in a way that absorbs all of one's time and emotional commitment. High control is also as it sounds, uh, where the member's capacity to make their own choices uh, is uh, strictly limited. Totalistic, totalitarian, um, these I think are, are easy to understand. Closed charismatic is an interesting um, term for a cult uh, because it uh, goes kind of right to the heart of how the cultic organization um, assigns authority and, uh, and, and creates its values, which is generally around the, uh, the weight, the gravity of a charismatic leader. And we'll see how when we get to a phenomenon like QAnon, uh, which has no leader at all, there's actually a vacuum of leadership at the center of it, uh, that becomes a problematic concept that we have to rework. 
Um, so closed charismatic would imply that there's no authority that enters into the group dynamic uh, that challenges the uh, radiant, you know, um, specialness of the 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 leader's, uh, you know, glowing presence. Ultra authoritarian, uh, I think, is a simple phrase. But then self sealed would be close in terminology to closed charismatic in the sense that uh, it, um, you know, there's 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 little possibility for the group member to appeal to outside information or to benefit from outside information. And then bounded choice is a pretty interesting concept. They describe it as um, the, the, a situation in which uh, anything that happens within the group uh, is obviously justified according to the group's ideology. Now, uh, a good example unfolding in you know, present context uh, of bounded choice would be what happens to the cognitive dissonance of the uh, hardcore Trump supporter uh, who is utterly convinced by their leader that the election currently is now being stolen. Um, what every single thing that happens from now until inauguration day has to be framed in terms of this fundamental denial of outside reality uh, and an acceptance of whatever the internal explanation would be. So, um, you know, the, the, the other thing about bounded choice is that um, if the prophecy of a given group um, comes true, then you know, obviously it's proven. If the prophecy of a given group does not come true, then it is posed to the member as a test of faith. And so there's no real sort of way out of the bounded choice scenario. Okay, so um, coming back to uh, solid, uh, full definition territory, uh, note the year here, this is 1986. And, you know, this very tight, what is it now? Um, it's a single sentence, it's a long sentence, but this very tight explanation has been uh, time tested, but we'll also see that it's not going to be able to accommodate uh, the volatility, the speed, um, the contagious quality of online sociology. Uh, okay, so this is from uh, Langoni and West. Uh, they say that a cult is a group or movement exhibiting a great or excessive devotion or dedication to some person, idea, or thing, and employing unethical, manipulative, or, or coercive techniques of persuasion and control. And now there's a great list here. Uh, and, you know, take a screenshot because... Uh, it's, it's kind of all of the main techniques are uh, involved here. Isolation from former friends and family. So in some groups, this might mean uh, residential isolation. It might mean uh, the strong encouragement to change one's name, uh, the strong encouragement to separate from one's uh, spouse or from one's, you know, you know uh, 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 immediate family. Um, when we get into online contexts, the isolation might be more implicit than explicit, and it might be demanded by the amount of time one simply has to spend online. Um, debilitation is, is kind of a, a vague word, but uh, as they unfold the definition in further writing, uh, they would talk about physical methods of weak, weakening a person's resolve or resilience. Uh, that can involve, you know, um, removing protein from the diet or calories from the diet. If any of you uh, watched any of the material around Nexium, you'll know that uh, Keith Raniere was really big on um, getting his uh, quote unquote slaves to beg him for permission to consume each calorie, you know, down to the single digit calorie. Uh, whenever they wanted to eat. Uh, use of special methods to heighten suggestibility and subservience. Now, in 
uh, in, in religious groups, let's say, the special methods that heightened suggestibility might involve uh, prayer or chanting or mantra or, um, you know, long meditation sessions or, you know, physical practices that leave you exhausted and vulnerable. Um, and then we have powerful group pressures, information management or careful control of who's allowed to know what, uh, suspension of individuality or critical judgment, uh, promotion of total dependency on the group and fear of leaving it. So there's your sort of core group of, of techniques. Uh, I think what is missing and what they might update this with, uh, if I was to add one more core technique, would be um, constant mutual surveillance, whereby uh, each member of the group actually ends up doing the work of the leadership uh, and eventually the surveillance is internalized so that uh, the group member is controlling themselves controlling themselves in such a way that the leadership doesn't really have to exert any effort um, now all of this uh, this is this is the punchline is designed to advance the goals of the group's leaders to the actual or possible detriment of members their families or the community i love the end of this def definition because um, uh, with one caveat, it, it, it suggests that the entire process of the, the, the cultic formation and its execution has nothing to do with the benefit of its members, uh, but it will say that it does. Uh, and that's where as we get to the next slide, we'll see that deception is actually the gateway for every cultic engagement. Um, you know, the famous line now that's being quoted all over the place from Mark Vicente out of The Vow, uh, which is kind of a terrible docu-series on, on Nexium. Uh, but he says, and this is a quote from a cult researcher named Kathleen Mann, who he doesn't reference, uh, but she says, nobody joins a cult. Uh, people, people delay leaving organizations that misrepresented themselves. So um, if you think about that in your own kind of, if you have a personal relationship to high, high demand groups, or if you can think of, you know, friends or family who have gotten involved in, in high demand groups, um, try to try to digest that very sort of foundational concept, because it's, extraordinarily relieving uh, and uh, it opens the door towards a lot of forgiveness and understanding. Um, the thing about deception as the gateway into cultic engagement or recruitment is that anybody, literally anybody is vulnerable to it. We all, I believe, like to think as human beings that we, um, would not fall for such a thing, that we would not believe Tony Robbins bullshit, that we wouldn't, you know, we would we would hear uh, Keith Raniere do his banal psychobabble and we would see right through it. Um, but when it comes down to it, uh, the definition of deception is that you actually don't know when it's happening. And so, you know, in the two in the two high demand groups and the two cults that I was in, um, members came from all kinds of educational backgrounds, uh, all kinds of. Um, let me just come out of screen share here. Uh, they came from all kinds of of professions, walks of life, um, all kinds of class backgrounds. They came from good families. They came from stressed families, uh, and what is unifying about. Uh, uh, us as members of a particular cultic organization uh, is not the specific ways in which we were vulnerable to indoctrination, but the fact that we were all vulnerable to deception. So I'll say a little bit more about that uh, as we go. Because, and, and I can just say that as a survivor twice of, of two different groups, that um, realizing that, that, um, that I lost that time, that I lost that uh, emotional labor, that I lost that money, that I lost that relational safety and security, that my, you know, my life path got derailed for years, 
um, because of because of these recruitments and engagements, because I was lied to, instead of because I was stupid, uh, was extraordinarily helpful for me in uh, my recovery process. Uh, okay, so let me just go back here and yeah, just go back to the end of this uh, great definition. The caveat that I wanted to to suggest was that the word designed makes it sound like uh, it's all intentional. And I think that that's really actually hard to discern. Certainly with somebody as organized and as sociopathic as Keith Raniere, there's a lot of design involved. You know, uh, if you look at that material at all, you'll see that, uh, you know, there was some meticulous planning going into how he was going to organize the the vertical power structures and who was going to pay tribute to whom and how collateral was going to be collected and who was allowed to communicate with whom. There's a lot of premeditation going on there. But um, in the two uh, cultic groups that I was in, it was more like the charismatic leaders fell into a pattern that that worked for them and for which they were socially rewarded. And they exhibited all of the, you know, or they or they enforced and, and created all of the conditions in the list above uh, in that parenthetical list. But they I don't think they necessarily did it uh, through planning. They, they, they might have even done it through mimicry too, because they were both great, great students of other high demand groups. Um, then the last couple of phrases, though, I want to land on, it says that all of this is happening to the actual or possible detriment of members, their families, or the community. So members, of course, but um, let's just talk about uh, the impacts of cults on the families of members, uh, which can be devastating, uh, and then the community as well as that wider ring. And if you want a good example of how just how... Um, much havoc uh, cultic dynamics can play on um, family and community relationships. Uh, you can take a brief look at a subreddit called QAnon Casualties, which I believe has more than 30,000 memories uh, members now. Uh, and they are um, recounting uh, their incredible stories of the blistering fast uh, red pilling of their families, uh, the the just like overwhelming uh, <laughs> uh, immersion and 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 its speed and its intensity uh, that um, people uh, that their that their family members uh, become completely overwhelmed. Um, yeah, thank you. It looks like you've put it up there. That's terrific. Uh, that that uh, their family members have become completely overwhelmed with with uh, the indoctrination that they've received, not through you know a charismatic leader or even a well formed group, but just through a kind of virus that is uh, blowing on the ether. Uh, so we'll talk about that in a bit. All right. Okay, um, so a couple of other very useful definitional models. Um, so Langoni, who was one of the partners on that longer definition from the previous slide, uh, came up with something very simple that you can commit to memory. Um, he defines the cult as um, being uh, an organization that perpetrates deception that forms dependency amongst its membership and it invokes dread of leaving. Uh, now, at some point when I'm presenting this material, somebody, somebody always makes the joke of, you know, well, that sounds like my family or that sounds like my marriage. Uh, and yes, um, in fact, uh, these dynamics are, are um, non-specific with regard to size or organizational intensity. Uh, in fact, a, a really excellent uh, cult uh, uh, researcher and recovery therapist named Rachel Bernstein, who runs an excellent podcast called Indoctrination, uh, is always speaking very eloquently about this, about how cultic dynamics can be useful uh, in their application to, you know, 
even family systems. So yeah, but uh, what I like about the elegancy, the elegance of the three Ds is that it really begins with uh, deception, which as I said, is this fundamental gateway. There is no such thing as a cultic organization that discloses what it's doing to its members or to anybody else. Um, and in fact, even, even within the, uh, the, the, the layers of commitment and indoctrination of a cult, uh, the, the people on the outer rim of an organization uh, will be deceived as to what the members closer to the center are doing. Uh, researcher and uh, legal specialist Kathleen Mann came up with the mind model, uh, manipulation, indoctrination, negation, and deception. I'm going to highlight negation there because she says that a core principle of any cultic dynamic uh, is the principle of the person's individuality or agency or uh, ego self-sense uh, being uh, either diminished or demolished altogether, that uh, the person is systematically trained to not think of themselves as being a self, uh, but as a part of the whole uh, and someone who is beholden through this economy of, you know, love bombing and then indebtedness. Now, Steve Hassan is very famous these days, uh, and he uh, got his start by uh, getting out of the 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 cult of Reverend Moon or the Unification Church back in the late seventies, um, and uh, he has been uh, as a mental health practitioner, uh, counseling people recovering from cultic engagements uh, for the last forty years or so. Uh, his uh, theoretical model is called the Bite Model. Uh, and uh, he concentrates on controls over behavior, information, thought, and emotion. Now, you might have seen him around uh, because basically, uh, you know, every time there, there's, a, there's a cult documentary or podcast, he'll be interviewed. Uh, but he's also uh, just published a book called The Cult of Trump. And... Um, you know, um, I think it's a I think it's a worthwhile model, uh, especially if we're talking about the power of charismatic leadership and uh, you know the indoctrination of followers. But I would suggest that his own bite model of behavior control, especially, doesn't really apply at at the scale of of national at the, of the at the scale of national politics, right? Like uh, Trump is not giving might be might be. Um, giving generalized instructions about how his followers should behave, but he's not controlling the actions uh, or the freedoms of their bodies in very particular ways, as we see in, let's say, yoga ashrams or or Buddhist meditation centers, where you know everybody has to get up at four in the morning, and you know everybody has to wash their teeth in a certain way, and everybody's going to do breathing exercises for X number of hours. Um, you know, behavioral control. Uh, usually means, you know, heavy, heavy uh, bodily rules from day to day. Uh, and that's one of the things that um, our current online contexts, group contexts, uh, which of course have expanded and become more complex since COVID began, um, that's where this is. This is where uh, these these models uh, meet some challenges because, you know, we've never seen um, cultic dynamics emerge online so quickly, and without this core principle involved of behavioral behavioral, i.e., bodily control. I mean, you know, if if your your cult is uh, organized around a meditation or yoga practice schedule uh, by which you have to, you know, accomplish all kinds of, you know, physical uh, uh, benchmarks every day and eat a certain type of food. How exactly is that going to be enforced if, if the mode of indoctrination is, you know, the YouTube algorithm? Um, it's not going to be the same thing. One might argue that the demands of 
uh, you know, the, the, the dopamine loop of social media or, you know, the, the, the magnetism of the YouTube algorithm might in itself be a kind of bodily control, but it's not going to be organized bodily control. People are going to respond to the technology with various, uh, you know, degrees of addictive patterning. Okay, uh, Lalich uh, talks about charismatic, the combination of charismatic authority, transcendent ideology, systems of control and systems of influence. Let me just focus on uh, transcendent ideology first and then charismatic authority. Transcendent ideology would mean any kind of unfalsifiable goal uh, that can only really be defined by the group and anybody outside of a group without full sort of, uh, emotional and perhaps bodily commitment to the group couldn't possibly understand it. So a transcendent ideology uh, it would be some kind of motivation or uh, ultimate mm, uh, ultimate end game that is just incomprehensible um, to those without outside of the group. But then. Uh, of the highest value, of, un, of the highest and unquestionable value to those inside the group. So if we were to apply, you know, the, the, the test of transcendent ideology to, let's say, the, uh, the discourse or the mythology of QAnon, uh, the, the basis of the transcendent ideology is that uh, Q is going to be helping Trump overcome the deep state at a specific time through the specific means of the storm whereby uh, the you know the the lieutenants of the deep state are all going to be rounded up and arrested and then executed and at that point the mole children will be released from underground bunkers you know in the New York subway system and all of the pedophiles will be put to death and then and then and then like there's there's a there's kind of like a, a feeling of of ultimate victory, which unfortunately in QAnon terms is kind of empty because nobody really knows what comes after that, right? Uh, how government actually reestablishes itself, or you know whether everybody's everybody's sort of uh, dead and ascended to five D consciousness at that point. It's not clear, but transcendent ideology uh, simply means. Um, uh, the the ultimate unspeakable goal to which you must be committed uh, without uh, reservation. But then charismatic authority uh, is very interesting. Um, the uh, the two groups that I was in were led by extremely charismatic individuals. Um, they uh, one was uh, Asian Classics Institute, and it was led by an American. Um, Tibetan Buddhist pseudo monk named Michael Roach. Uh, he's still alive and doing his thing, although not anywhere they can speak English because the press is too bad. Um, and uh, he was just electrifying as a speaker. Uh, he was uh, overwhelmingly passionate about uh, his content. Uh, he could uh, weep with compassion for the sick and dying of the world at will. Uh, he was just a kind of, um, you know, throbbing heart of, of, a, of a man and uh, very attractive as well, to me at least. Uh, there was something that um, I found mirrored uh, in him uh, about myself. And um, yeah, uh, it's hard to imagine my recruitment into Michael Roach's group without the sort of the intensity of his physical presence. Uh, the same thing was true with the second group that I was in. It was called Endeavor Academy. Uh, the teacher's name was Charles Anderson. He died in 2009. Uh, and uh, he also was intensely charismatic, though in a different way, um, more of a kind of, you know, if, if you can believe it, a kind of Archie Bunker preacher uh, who was, you know, foul mouthed, but also like extremely funny uh, and but but like endlessly creative. Charisma is 
this central sort of key mystery within the cultic formation. And uh, it's not really a stable uh, quality. Um, it's not really a property of the person either. It's more of a, um, uh, a social feedback loop that's, that's contagious. Uh, and that explains why some people are absolutely enthralled as soon as they begin to hear Tony Robbins speak and some people want to run screaming out of the room. Um, there's no sort of um, uh, metric for what constitutes charisma. It's more like a, uh, as I said, a, a contagious social feedback loop that builds upon itself in kind of uh, um, group intensity. Now, you, you might be able to see that with uh, a phenomenon like QAnon, the principle of charisma begins to fall apart because um, at, uh, you know, who exactly is, is leading this thing? Um, and I've thought about this a lot because, you know, as journalists and politicians and policymakers and, you know, public health officials start to look to, to cult researchers to say, okay, well, how can you help us you know, um, deal with the disinformation that's being put out by QAnon related groups about, you know, vaccines or about the PCR test or about COVID being a hoax or whatever. Um, you know, we've got to sort of, from, from the cult research side, we've got to come up with answers that uh, are fit for the digital age. And so here's my idea is that, you know, um, by definition, uh, QAnon is a leaderless group. Um, uh, of course, they believe that there is someone named Q uh, or someone who, who takes, takes the, the code name of Q and that that's a unified you know, human being somewhere on the planet. But they know that they will never know who it is. They know that they, it will never be disclosed what he is like. Uh, what they have is sort of hints and insinuations as to his character from the syntax and the, the gravitas of, of the Q drops. But um, when it comes down to it, Q isn't there. And so we have this incredibly powerful global cultic organization with many of taking on many of the aspects of a new religion as well that is centered around a vacant throne. Like there's, there's an absence at the center of this movement. And so when I, and, and usually in, in pre-digital cult theory, uh, the center of that movement is charismatic authority. Um, the, the, the principle that the specialness and perhaps the divine inspiration of the leader is kind of like the unquestionable, you know, the buck stops here, uh, um, uh, uh, reality principle. But when there's nothing there at the center, what takes over that power? What, what, what charges that environment up? The answer that I've come up with that so far is that um, if, if charisma is a social phenomenon, uh, some of the energy that uh, it's associated with is likely being created by the process in QAnon of what we call gamification, uh, which means that everybody in the online environment is empowered to be a quote unquote digital soldier, but more importantly, to become an interpreter of Q's, um, you know, bizarre and cryptic messages. So there's a way in which the excitement that people have uh, and project towards a central leader is actually shared and dispersed throughout the group as the expertise with regard to interpreting Q's message is also a shared enterprise. Um, okay. Uh, then maybe the, the last thing that I will uh, look at uh, in terms of definition, and then maybe I'll take a look at some questions is, um, 
maybe the 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 model that I find, I mean, all everything one through four here, these are all great. But I think the the one that might be most useful, most accessible, most um, most elegant, and also most tender is uh, comes from the very recent work of a cult survivor and researcher named Alexandra Stein in the UK. And what she does is, if there are any therapists in the group, you'll know what I'm talking about. She uses attachment theory to describe how the basic function of the cult is to rewire the attachment pattern of the member towards the disorganized. Uh, and so let me just take uh, a look at um, what that looks like. Okay, so before I, I read out this quote, um, I'll just say that uh, as a primer, uh, attachment theory suggests that uh, very, very briefly, um, and I'm not a psychotherapist, I, but I had to study it for, for this stuff, um, that attachment theory suggests that the ways in which we have been, we have experienced care from primary caregivers um, have distinctive qualities to them that can extend out to all relational patterning that, uh, that, that happens later in life. Uh, and that really what is the main determinant of the qualities of attachment is the dependability of the caregiver. Uh, and what the child or the one who is receiving care does in response to that dependability. So, you know, uh, with perfect secure attachment, which nobody has, but everybody aspires to, but some people, but many people will feel at, at, at some moments in life, uh, they know that uh, their needs are attended to by the caregiver, but they also know that if they leave the caregiver's presence, or if there is some temporary rupture in the relationship, that when the relationship is resumed or repaired, that things will be fine that things will still be secure. Um, now, uh, most of us, so the theory goes, go through life um, you know, navigating a series of insecure attachments uh, or less secure attachments, whereby um, our caregivers are not entirely dependable. And then we develop strategies of, of mitigating that lack of dependability. Uh, and one strategy would be to develop anxious attachment where one is always trying to, you know, gain the attention of the caregiver uh, in a kind of, a kind of uh, yearning way. Uh, and then the other side of that spectrum would be uh, the avoidance strategy that uh, is, tends to uh, cut emotional losses to say as the child, well, you know, I don't really trust that you're going to be there for me when I need you. So I'm going to close myself off to needing you all together. I'm going to shut myself down uh, and I'm going to manage my own uh, uh, my own safety. Uh, thank you very much. And that would be uh, uh, more avoidant or sometimes it's called dismissive. But um, the, the, the key here is that the most stressful type of uh, attachment patterning is called disorganized. And this emerges in very tragic circumstances in which the caregiver is so unpredictable uh, and volatile and dangerous that the child or the person who, who is receiving care is perpetually confused and hypervigilant as to what kind of parent or care they will receive at any given moment. Uh, and, uh, you know, if the caregiver is violent, if they are a substance abuser, if they assault the child, if they, um, but then also the child knows that they depend upon them, uh, the disorganized attachment pattern forms around this tension whereby the person you must love is also the person that you are terrified of. And disorganized attachment patterns then look like this endless push and pull of wanting to be close to the person that you are terrified of. All right, so that's my little summary of attachment theory. What Alexandra Stein says is that regardless of how you attach to your caregivers in your regular life, 
What the cult does is it reorganizes your attachments so that you are always in a disorganized state, so that you are always running towards the thing that you were actually terrified of and controlled by. And this puts you in a constant state of hypervigilance and arousal that can be interpreted by the cult as engagement, commitment, perhaps even enlightenment. Uh, so to give you a personal example of how this worked in my life, uh, you know, the, the central, the daily ritual of, uh, of Endeavor Academy was a kind of prayer meeting uh, in which there was uh, a lot of somatic bodily, you know, kundalini type activity, but there was also a lot of spiritual confrontation and hazing and, uh, and insults and forced confessions and all kinds of terrible things that, of course, the cult said were good for me or good for us or good for our personal development. Uh, and the feeling of disorganized attachment I came to realize years later was the fact that every single morning when it was time to go to that session, uh, as I approached the building, I would feel this like just unbearable nausea and dread, shaking, acidic, like muscle knotted, quaking dread that then, but I couldn't not go. I was, I, I was, I was convinced that I had to go for my own good. I was convinced that I, uh, if I, if I didn't go, that I would be somehow abdicating my responsibility towards, you know, personal development and so on. Um, and the, the, the feeling of that was so incredibly stressful that the only way it could be resolved would be through moments of dissociative uh, ecstasy, um, whereby uh, my it would feel like my brain would just stop, I would just surrender, I would go limp emotionally, uh, and I would be filled with a sense of relaxation and the warmth that accompanied that. And the cult was very good. And, and you know, I, I researched this, I do journalism on this, and, and this moment, this technique comes up over and over again. So this is not isolated. I'm not, I'm not talking about something that is, um, you know, you know uh, eccentric or unique to me. Uh, the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the moment of surrender is interpreted as a kind of personal, psychological, or spiritual breakthrough by the group. And you come to associate the, the moment of what is essentially a trauma response of folding under pressure with a kind of salvation, which is what the group actually promised you. So um, uh, just to go back to Stein, because she says it very, very clearly, uh, what this looks like in uh, caregiving relationships is uh, that disorganized attachment responses occur uh, when a child has been in a situation of fright without solution. Their caregiver is at once the safe haven and also the source of threat or alarm. So when the child feels threatened by the caregiver, he or she is caught in an impossible situation. Both comfort and threat are represented by the same person, the caregiver, and the child experiences the unresolvable paradox of seeking to simultaneously flee and flee from and approach the caregiver. And this happens at a biological level, not thought out or conscious, but as evolved behavior to fear. The child attempts to run to and flee from the caregiver at one and the same time. However, in most cases, the need for proximity, for physical closeness, tends to override attempts to avoid the fear-arousing caregiver. So usually the child stays close to the frightening parent while internally both their withdrawal and approach systems are simultaneously activated and in conflict. Now, when we talk about the, uh, the cult members need to stay close to the leader or to the center of the group, we might be talking about financial need, social need, the fact that they have been isolated or they have isolated themselves from their family or from other support systems. Uh, the need can be existential. Uh, so let me, yeah, I, well, I didn't leave 15 minutes for questions, but let me just take a look at the questions here. Um, 
Uh, so, so Chloe has commented that at the mention of mutual surveillance, for some reason, I thought of the concept of the panopticon. I think you're right on there, actually, uh, is that uh, the panopticon is, is, uh, is it Jeremy Bentham's formulation of the self-organizing uh, prison? whereby uh, you can you can look it up. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, architectural image, also extremely eerie, where there's a central um, observation point and then clear lines of sight uh, to the individual cells uh, by which um, the inmates of any given cell will feel as though they are uh, being watched, not only by the central hub, but by each other. Uh, and the thing is, is that is that nobody has to be in the central tower in order for it to work. Um, and yeah, uh, at a certain point, what happens in cultic organizations is that nobody has to be telling you what to do because you have internalized the control mechanisms. And in fact, in some models, that's the definition of indoctrination is that you've internalized the control mechanisms to such an extent that you can't help but virally transmit them onto other people. Um, now, the speed with which this happens with, uh, with QAnon members is extraordinary because, you know, they can go from indoctrination to active vectors of the brain worm in a very short period of time, sometimes only a week. Um, you mentioned Tony Robbins as being bullshit. Would like to hear more on how you arrived at your specific opinion. Oh, uh, sorry, and sorry if that's if if it's if if it's offensive. Yeah, I mean, um, well, I'm not. I, I won't take it back. Uh, Tony Robbins uh, sells, um, you know, an unending series of pyramid type self help notions that are absolutely content free uh, and that uh, are, are unproven except by the endless propaganda that's internally generated uh, by his, by the completed, uh, you know, course members. Um, he suppresses all dissent. Uh, he, um, I mean, you, you can just look through the, uh, is it, BuzzFeed that did the series of articles on on uh, you know his his sort of low level Keith Raniere uh, practices over the years, uh, multiple sexual assaults um, uh, and and uh, control of staff members and so on, um, and also I mean whether whether he's a cult leader or not, uh, the techniques of repetitive jargon of uh, somatic dominance as he does sort of unqualified psychotherapy on stage in front of hundreds of you know thousands of people uh, these like sort of um, unlicensed uh, emotional bullying techniques uh, very very suspicious and utterly charismatic you know like there's no th this is not a person who references research who like you know uh, substantiates anything that he that he says or or backs up any of his claims uh, yeah pretty clear red flags um, let's see here um, are there let's see here are there parallels to divine hideness? I'm not quite sure what that means, hideness. Uh, why do I personally refer to QAnon as QAnon, C-U-E, uh, um, Anon on Twitter? Oh, I think I probably started doing that to avoid um, the AI removing accounts that might be promoting QAnon. So there was a there was a there was a couple of weeks in which uh, the word itself was tag tar targeted as a as a hashtag or even just a piece of text. So um, let's see here. It seems to me like every mainstream religion meets the definitions of a cult and demonstrates the same characteristics. Do you see differences between the most common global religions versus the more obscure cults? Um, well. If if you if you if you screenshot the definitions, um, you know, there. Let's let's take the Catholic Church, which I grew up in, uh, just for instance. Uh, was I deceived uh, 
in my uh, recruitment or my indoctrination. You know, an atheist would say that I was deceived in the sense that I was told something as a child that wasn't true. But if I think about it in in, in almost like consumerist terms, uh, the Catholic Church did not deceive me in terms of what it offered. Now, if I was one of its victims of, of, of childhood sexual abuse, then that's a different story. But if we're just talking about what the mainstream religion does, does it deceive its members about the product that it's offering? Um, that's different from Keith Raniere uh, offering self-help improvement programs, uh, but what he really wants to do is to create a legion of sexual slaves, right? Like that's, that's just, th those, are, those are two different categories altogether. Um, can people become dependent on the Catholic Church uh, socially, financially? Yes and yes. Can they, uh, can they experience dread of leaving? Yes. Uh, will the intensity of that dread of leaving be similar to the dread of leaving Keith Raniere's Nexium or Scientology? If, if you leave the Catholic Church, will people come after you and try to destroy your life and bankrupt you? Probably not. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's often it's it's often a comparison or a kind of what aboutism that's made. Well, what about you know organized religions? Aren't they cults? Well, for the most part, they are too diverse, too decentralized, uh, and um, and 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 not frankly deceptive enough to qualify uh, within the literature. And but that isn't to say that within a highly structured organization like the Catholic Church, there can't be cultic hotspots uh, in which the principles of deception, dependence, and dread of leaving apply. Uh, divine hiddenness. Let's see. Are there parallels between cults and divine hiddenness? You were talking about a cult without a center. Oh, uh, with an empty throne at the center, which I thought had parallels to the idea of a hiding God. Yeah, it sounds like it sounds like you're referring to like a theological doctrine that I'm just not familiar with. Um, I mean, the function of of Q as as an invisible leader uh, is very um, nimble, actually, because what the figure can do is it can always change the goalposts. It, it doesn't have to live up to any expectations. Uh, it can always pivot uh, and it can always be projected into. So if those are some of the qualities of, of you know, divine hiddenness, then, then yeah, maybe there's a parallel. Mm. Uh, what will the impact of having two GOP members of Congress elected two weeks ago who have pledged their allegiance to QAnon? Well, it uh, remains to be seen. I mean, um, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene obviously is uh, being uh, uh, promoted internally by some segments of the GOP as kind of like a rising star. Um, she's obviously going to bring a lot of uh, energy to the Georgia Senate race coming up in uh, January. Uh, it, I think it'll be interesting to see how her Twitter feed continues to unfold because, you know, every time I look at it, all of the tweets are blocked or sh shielded because they're filled with misinformation. Um, yeah, I mean, I almost want to say that the post-election fate of QAnon is, its, it's, is another whole topic because it has to do with, you know, what happens when prophecy fails. Um, and how will people double down or how will they withdraw? How will they get out? Uh, that's a complex question. Mm. How do you see QAnon carrying forward by followers higher ups in the years to come? 
you know, I just finished, maybe I'll finish with this, with this, uh, because this is a Canadian audience. I, I just, uh, filed a feature with the walrus, um, about QAnon in, uh, Canada. And, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't come to any sort of definitive conclusions about what it is or where it's going, but there was a couple of things that were, were clear. Uh, one is that for what it's worth and with all of its holes, uh, the existence of uh, the whatever social safety nets and especially healthcare safety nets we enjoy in this country uh, mean that the general libertarian, uh, hyper-individualistic, uh, n nobody's really going to take care of you except, you know, your relationship to God or your relationship to Q, uh, that is just will just does not have as much cultural traction here. Um, it also seems, you know, you, the, there was just a question about Marjorie Taylor Greene. Uh, you, you know, there were 82, um, people running for Congress who had pledged some kind of allegiance to QAnon. Uh, here in Canada, Maxime Bernier uh, retweets something from a QAnon account and has to delete it and apologize the next day. Uh, there was a conservative MP, uh, Kelly, I can't remember her last name, I just reported on her, did the same thing. She retweeted something as affiliated with QAnon. Uh, it was down that afternoon. Uh, the only uh, politician of note that I ran into, oh yeah, then there was a guy from the Saskatchewan party uh, who Scott Moe turfed out for liking a QAnon related piece of content on social media. So there's something either modest or, you know, intolerant of absurdism in Canadian politics, you know, maybe something, I don't know, no nonsensey and Trudeauian, uh, as in senior, uh, that is just doesn't seem to want to tolerate uh, uh, QAnon as being part of the political discourse. But where, where QAnon is influential, uh, is in wellness discourse amongst yoga influencers. And uh, in Toronto, uh, well, in, I mean, it's, it's, it's got branches in other parts of the country as well, but uh, there's a Toronto-based organization called The Line. Uh, and uh, I interviewed its leader. Uh, his name is Lamont Daigle. Uh, and they do uh, very interesting, eclectic, um, sometimes bizarre anti-mask protests every Saturday downtown Toronto for a couple of hours. Uh, and their very striking logo, uh, if you turn it to the side a little bit, looks like a Q. Uh, and if you listen to their uh, speakers and if you follow their social media, uh, well, you know, closely enough, you'll see that a lot of the themes overlap, that there's a, you know, a belief in uh, a satanic cabal uh, that, um, you know, that Trudeau is, both Castro's son and a pedophile that, uh, you know, um, you know, and, and, and they've, they've, they've managed with some of the protests in Toronto to gather, um, you know, four to 5,000 participants on, on, on any given Saturday. Um, but it doesn't feel politically coherent to me yet. Uh, and I haven't heard of anybody being able to break into you know, where they would be most welcome, which would be sort of Alberta politics uh, yet. And so uh, what, what I believe is happening uh, in as QAnon both goes transnational, but also survives the American election and therefore the reliance upon the narrative of Trump being, um, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the movement's messiah will become less and less important. Um, that it feels like QAnon um, will become more like a uh, religious movement that has impacts upon the culture wars um, and uh, perhaps begins to influence 
um, uh, uh, you know, other minor cults uh, throughout throughout the country. So that's a kind of roundabout uh, answer. Um, let's see here. Haven't a couple of churches of QAnon been set up? Yeah, in the States, that's true. Any thoughts, Emily? No, I think you've expressed like so much on this topic that I had no idea about. Thank you so much for being so eloquent and providing like such a deep insight on these issues. Oh, you're um, welcome. Like further reading resources that you can suggest for people. I know you put a link at the beginning of the chat. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's actually pretty good as a, as a starter, uh, pack. Um, and I think John Jalalich's reading list is on that page. Um, let's see. Oh, you know, and if you have the stomach for it, if you have the spoons for it, um, uh, the best piece of popular cult documentation and literature out there right now is Seduced on the Stars Network, uh, and that's that's digging into uh, Keith Raniere's Nexium. Uh, don't waste your time with the Vow, in my opinion. Um, it's very conflicted in terms of uh, its its interests and its lack of disclosures of certain things. Like the producers were actually friends of the main characters. Uh, and, uh, you know, it didn't disclose that, um, they, they took courses with, with Nexium and didn't disclose that, uh, there's a lot of crap going on with, uh, that, with that series that really, uh, diminishes the, the, I think the crucial task of cult analysis to a kind of, uh, reality TV. And that's really unfortunate, but, um, Cecilia Peck is the director of seduced and it is survivor centered. And it actually has excellent cult experts like John Jalalich and Rick Ross and Steve Hassan and Rachel Bernstein guiding the viewer through, you know, here is how this thing actually worked and, and giving expert perspective on that. So, um, so I'd say, yeah, uh, anything, anything that, that, uh, feels sensational and mysterious with regard to, to the portrayal of cultic dynamics, just stay away from, cause you're probably not going to learn much from, uh, but seduced is excellent. Um, kind of going off of that, if I could just add one final question, um, what would you recommend in terms of like people here today, uh, kind of digesting and cutting through the noise of sensationalism in like what's been reported on cults and just like all the media around cults in order to find out what the core facts are. Um, I mean, let's see. I mean, the resources that I've pointed to, I think are, are, are pretty good. Um, I think the core principle is, uh, you know, recognize that this is actually a, a, you know, an academic and scholarly subject. Uh, you know, people have been working at this for a long time. Um, it's it's easy to oh here here I, here here's what I'll say. It's easy to uh, to to trivialize or to or to sensationalize the weirdness of a particular uh, cultic movement, but that's not gonna help you connect with the uh, forces of manipulation or the impacts of what the recruitment or the indoctrination actually does. So, um, you know, one thing that, uh, I interviewed Mike Rains for our podcast called Conspirituality Podcast, and he's one of the main moderators for QAnon Casualties. And, uh, you know, I said, you know, what, what would you suggest for journalists who really want to get this right? And he said, he said, stop talking about the gore. Stop talking about uh, the, the QAnon themes of, you know, pedophilia and adrenochrome and vampirism and, you know, mole children and, you know, Satanism and all of that stuff. All of that, all of what that does is it casts the, uh, the 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 member or the follower as some kind of like you know naive 
freak who who you know is has bought into something ridiculous um concentrate on the fact that uh this is that that uh q's predictions are false uh that the time that is spent investigating them is wasted <laughs> uh and that people who end up uh, spending, committing their sort of, you know, emotional lives to this material, um, they don't deserve that. They don't deserve to be lied to. Um, they, they are people. They have families. Um, they, um, uh, they can be welcomed back to reality. And maybe the last thing that I'd say is that if you know any, anybody who has been uh, drawn in to a cultic organization or has become fascinated with QAnon, um, maintain the friendship. Uh, don't tell them that they're stupid. Uh, if you start to debate data or argue facts with them and it doesn't go anywhere, stop. Uh, because the, the thing that they will need most uh, on the other side is the security that the cultic organization is actually taking away from them and replacing with a kind of hypercharged uh, attachment that's disorganized. So, um, yeah, the 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 thing that you do as a friend uh, for the person who really has lost their way is that you wait for them and you show them, uh, however you can, that they can come back uh, and that reality will still be waiting for them. Uh, and uh, you will still love them and, and you know, things you can get on with it. Yeah, thank you so much, Michael. I really appreciate that. Um, and for taking the time to uh, talk with us tonight. And thanks everyone who came. Um, I really appreciate such a good crowd showing up tonight. Uh, definitely one of our bigger events. Um, so I'm just gonna throw the fundraiser link in the chat one more time. If you like tonight's event, um, definitely please consider a donation to us um, as it is uh, that fund that will make sure that we can continue to hold events like this into the new year and in the future. Um, but yeah, uh, I know um, the resource that Matthew uh, was talking about with his podcast is at the very top of the chat. So definitely feel free to scroll up there and click that really quick before the meeting ends. Um, but yeah, thanks everyone so much for coming. And uh, this will be available um, as a video very soon. All right. Thanks Thank so much. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. Thank you, everybody. Bye.